Okay, let's rock and roll. Please wend your way to a seat. Good evening, I'm Mike Wallace. I'm the director of the Gotham Center for New York City History. And for those of you who are coming to one of our events for the first time, I should just say that this is part of a regular series of programs, uh, some of which, like this evening, like to look at contemporary issues and set them in historical context, mixing and matching past and present. Uh, others uh, focus on new and interesting uh, historical uh, scholarship. Um, and next, uh, our next uh, event is on April 26th and uh, seemingly in a remarkably different direction. It looks at the history of spiritualism in New York. Uh, although, in fact, in its day, it, was, uh, it had seriously scientific components to it. But we'll leave that for then. Uh, we have many, many other projects that we do, uh, and one of the places that you can go to find out about it is our website at the W's Gotham Center dot uh, org, alas, not com. Uh, we make no money uh, on the deal, but what we do is try to provide public service and information. So there is on this site, among other things, a calendar of events. You can click on any day of the year, and you will get information about uh, 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 lectures, museum exhibitions, uh, a whole variety of things that deal with the history of New York City. Uh, GothamCenter.org. Uh, now, uh, tonight uh, we have a, a, a wonderful event on water, its supply then and now, uh, and we are uh, delighted to be co-sponsoring uh, this event uh, with uh, two uh, uh, crucial organizations. Uh, one of them is the High Bridge Coalition, which uh, I should remind you, if you don't know, is dedicated to restoring and preserving the High Bridge, reestablishing it as the Manhattan Bronx link in the old Croton Aqueduct Trail Greenway and restoring the parks at both ends of the bridge. And there's a whole list of organizations, and I'm sure many of uh, their members are, are here this evening. Um, the uh, other uh, agency is a uh, crucial uh, public uh, organization, the Devar Department of Environmental Protection, uh, and I'm delighted to uh, introduce, to welcome you uh, here this evening, Commissioner uh, Emily Lloyd. Commissioner Lloyd has had a long and distinguished uh, career in the public and the private sector. She was the Commissioner uh, for Traffic for the City of Boston. I guess that was before the big dig. Uh, luckily. Um, then she served as the Director of Business Development at the uh, Port Authority of New York. Uh, she was a commissioner uh, in an earlier life for the Department of Sanitation under David Dinkins from 92 to 94 and was involved, I believe, in uh, getting recycling uh, off the ground. Then uh, she spent uh, 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 several years as Executive Vice President for Administration at uh, Columbia University. Uh, and now the city is, uh, I believe, fortunate in having her uh, at the uh, Department of Environmental Protection. Please welcome Commissioner Lloyd. Thank you very much. It's so nice to see you all here tonight. Uh, I consider it a great privilege and challenge to have the opportunity to be Commissioner of DEP. Uh, because I've only been commissioner for uh, two months, and uh, for that reason, I'm not able to stay tonight because I had a commitment that I made before I was commissioner. But I did want to say that I understand this is being recorded in some form, and it's going to be such an informative and lively evening that I intend to listen to it. So please speak up when you make your comments, because I'll look forward to what, whether they are positive about DEP or not. I'll look forward to hearing them. This year, DEP is celebrating the 100th anniversary of the creation of the New York City Board of Water Supply. Establishing the board allowed the city to expand its water supply beyond the Croton system, the city's original source of drinking water, to include the Catskill and Delaware watersheds in upstate New York. As part of that celebration, I'd like to thank you for coming to this evening's event a discussion of the past, present, and future of New York City's water supply system, entitled A Study in the Monumental. 
Tonight's panel, the first of two planned programs, is co-sponsored by the Gotham Center and the Highland Bridge Coalition, which is spearheading a campaign to restore and reopen the High Bridge as well as the parks at both the Bronx and Manhattan ends of the bridge. Structures like the High Bridge, which carried water from the old Croton Aqueduct across the Harlem River, survive as reminders of the true visionaries who conceived and constructed this lifeline to the city. The modern day equivalent and outgrowth of the early water supply engineering is the current construction of a modern monumental feat of technology and engineering, the third water tunnel, largely unseen by the general public as it burrows beneath the city anywhere from 400 to 800 feet below ground. And as I was commenting earlier, it's not a bad thing probably that it's out of sight and out of mind because it makes it easy to keep it moving along. DEP is proud to be a member of the Highbridge Coalition, which also includes the New York City Departments of Parks and Recreation and Transportation, Friends of Highbridge Park, Friends of the Old Croton Aqueduct, the New Restoration Project, the National Park Service, and the Partnership for Parks. Please also keep an eye out for the second program planned for the fall, which will highlight New York City water supply system, but also explore the future of water delivery systems nationwide. We would also like to thank Mike Wallace and the Gotham Center for New York City History for co-sponsoring and hosting this evening. This event and the conference this fall will provide an opportunity both to remember and honor an important and invaluable part of New York City's history and allow us to explore the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. Thank you. Now, for the remainder of the evening, uh, I'm going to uh, turn the uh, moderator's duties uh, over to uh, perhaps uh, the best qualified uh, person for the job, uh, Gerard Coppell, who is uh, a writer and a journalist, uh, at one point an editor at CBS News, uh, but he is better known as uh, our uh, premier historian of the water supply of New York City. Uh, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, his uh, Water for Gotham history uh, came out in the year 2000, and it traces the history of drinking water in New York City. Uh, and it uh, received uh, a bundle of uh, well-merited laudatory uh, reviews. The New York Times called it extraordinarily well-researched and remarkably readable. Uh, Library Journal called it a fascinating play-by-play -play tale. Uh, the New York Observer said it was most certainly not uh, a book uh, for uh, New Yorkers uh, only. So I'm going to uh, ask Mr. Coppell to introduce our uh, fascinating and distinguished panel uh, and direct the remainder of the evening. Thank you so much for coming and have fun. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for that introduction. Thanks, uh, Commissioner Lloyd, uh, for coming and saying a few important words about uh, our city's water supply. I'm going to be the first talker, but I'm going to give introduce you to all the, uh, the talkers in the panel, and then we can uh, go from, from, uh, uh, from presentation to presentation quickly and hopefully have time for some uh, question and answer afterwards. Um, after uh, my talk, uh, Joel Mealy will go. Joe uh, has been an engineer, I think, uh, since before I was born. He was the commissioner of uh, the uh, city's uh, Department of Environmental Protection from uh, 1996 to 2002. Uh, before that, he was the city's building commissioner. Uh, and since 2002, uh, Joel has been uh, the commissioner of the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals. Uh, Joel is going to focus this evening uh, on the Catskill and Delaware systems, uh, their history and engineering, efforts at conservation of uh, our uh, water supply, and also the future of uh, the city's water supply system generally. Uh, after Joel, we'll hear from uh, Diane Galusha. Uh, she is the author of Liquid Assets, A History of New York City's Water System, uh, published by Purple Mountain Press in 1999. Uh, our books are both the best books on uh, the current best books on New York City's water supply. 
Uh, she's the uh, communication director and education coordinator of the nonprofit Catskill Watershed Corporation, which administers environmental protection, economic development, and education programs in the city's Catskill Delaware watershed. Uh, she is going to give us the view from the watershed, a perspective that is often blurred here in the city. Uh, Robert Kornfeld will be our next speaker. He's an architect and an associate of the Thornton Tomasetti Group. He's vice president of the Friends of the Old Croton Aqueduct, uh, and he was the historian and co-author of the recently published map and guide, The Old Croton Aqueduct in New York City. Uh, Bob is going to tell us about the history of the Great High Bridge, which uh, Commissioner Lloyd uh, made reference to, uh, and he will trace it from its creation in the 1830s, uh, for the Croton system to its up to its pending rebirth uh, as a place of urban recreation. After that, we'll hear from uh, Michael Solomon. Uh, Michael is the director of Roadway Bridges for the City of New York Department of Transportation. Uh, this is a $1 billion capital program. Uh, he is going to tell us uh, about the engineering inspection of the high bridge. Uh, which uh, is ongoing and hopefully will lead to, at some point in the future, uh, the um, uh, recreation of the High Bridge as a recreational place. And finally, uh, we'll hear from Dale Estes. Uh, Dale is a second generation sand hog. I think probably most of you know what that is. Sand hogs are the guys that get down there and build our tunnels. He is a 34 year member of Local 147. Uh, employed for the last two decades uh, on the third water tunnel, which Commissioner Lloyd referred to. Uh, he's currently the tunnel superintendent for Schiavone Shea Front, uh, Frontier Kemper uh, and works working, he, uh, Dale is now at Shaft 26B. And Dale's talk will be about the work of the Sandhog and how uh, it has changed and evolved over the past 30 years. So now I will go first. And this is the, the history portion. Um, I just want to tell you that each of the speakers is supposed to be limited to 15 minutes, so we will have time for Q&A. Uh, I usually do my, my history talk. It takes 45 minutes. I think I've got it down to 15. A couple of weeks ago, we were, uh, our family was skiing out in uh, Utah. And um, by the way, Salt Lake City gets its, its water from snowpack, which I discovered when I was out there. And um, we had a, a four-foot snowfall one day, and we were locked in our lodge. We couldn't move. And uh, our 12-year-old son uh, decided to organize all the kids at the lodge and have a, uh, keep them, to keep them busy during the day and uh, came up with a little presentation for the adults uh, just before dinner that was called uh, The History of the World in 30 Minutes, which he succeeded in doing. And he told me that I should at least be able to get through the history of New York City water in 15. So let's get started and let me see if I can figure out the technology. How's the focus? Okay, good. The first thing to remember about New York City water is that uh, for 200 years, we had, or the people who were living here on Manhattan, had lousy well water. And since 1842, now 163 years, 163 years and counting, we have had excellent distant river and mountain stream water. So that's the basic idea, 1842, before that terrible, since then, wonderful. And now we're going to work our way through. Um, this first slide is Upper Manhattan in its natural state before uh, anybody was living permanently on the island. And you can tell, probably, that all the various black lines are natural streams. Um, okay. Okay. I may need technical assistance here. Oh, yeah. I, I hate it when that happens. Well, how is that? Is it good enough? 
Yes? Okay. Uh, yes, I can do that also. I thought I had pre-done it. That's good? Perfect. Okay, we'll go from there. That is Upper Manhattan. We move down to Lower Manhattan. Again, a bunch of streams. You'll notice this black dot here. That is the Sunfish Pond. And right about here is where we are right now. Sunfish Pond is at 32nd and, and uh, Park. Uh, a little further south is this dot here. That is the Freshwater Pond. Uh, the greatest natural feature of, uh, of Manhattan with um, outlets to the Hudson River through what is now Canal Street and outlets to the East River uh, through what is now uh, basically Chinatown. What you'll notice is at the lower southern tip of the island isn't much surface water and of course that's where the Dutch set up shop in the 1620s because probably it looked most like home. Here's what the Dutch town looked like in 1660 toward the end of its uh, run, toward the end of, uh, of uh, New York's run as New Amsterdam, uh, inside the wall of Wall Street. Um, and what you may notice is in these yards are actually uh, the yards of brewers who were amongst the uh, most prominent people in New York during the Dutch period. Uh, because they made beer, and beer is pretty much what people drank in New Amsterdam because the water at the low-lying southern tip of Manhattan was not very good. You'll notice also, this is the fort where uh, Bowling Green is now, and you may not be able to see it actually, but you, there is no well anywhere in or near the fort. And that was a problem for the Dutch in 1664 when the English arrived and took over the city. And Stuyvesant surrendered very quickly because he told his employers, the West India Company, that he had no well in his fort to water his troops. So New York City's first water shortage in 1664. The city turns English and um, eventually builds a well in front of the fort. This is a WPA poster from the 1930s. It's wrong. It says that there was a well in 1658. Uh, in fact, this well in front of the fort was built in 1689. And it marked the beginning of systematic public well drilling, uh, well digging in New York City. This is the town as it looked under the English in 1695. See, the city has expanded beyond Wall Street up what is going to be Broadway, and the map maker in 1695 thought it very important to add these features right here, these little dots as they appear on Broad Street, Broadway, and the street that was becoming Wall Street, and those are public wells, about a dozen of them in 1695, the first public wells in the city. Uh, I mentioned uh, the freshwater pond earlier. This is what it might have looked like. I think this artwork was done in the uh, middle 1800s, but this is probably what the, collect, the freshwater pond, later called the collect pond, looked like. Um, and here's a, a sense of it in, um, in the streetscape. And the pond was at the, beyond the limits of the city through the 1700s and eventually was filled in in the early 1800s as development uh, moved north from the southern tip of the island and um, required, uh, the pond required filling in to become real estate. Um, we're just dwelling on this for one second because the Collect Pond was, uh, 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 the source of its water was, were subterranean springs which played a, a major role in the three major uh, water sources for the city <clears throat> before the Croton Aqueduct was built in the 1840s. This is the tea water pump here on what is now Park Row. I'll talk about that in a moment. Up here on Broadway uh, by White Street was an effort called the New York Water Works. I'll talk about that in a moment. And down here on Chambers Street between Chambers and Reed was something called the Manhattan Company. And uh, I'll talk about that as well. The first uh, 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 feature that I pointed out was the tea water pump. And this was a, a privately owned pump that functioned, that flourished from, seven, from the 1740s to the 
um, 80s. It was a private pump. The water was, de was uh, delivered to uh, purchaser purchasers of the water by uh, uh, cart, and it was not generally used because it was expensive. Most of the local, uh, most of the people of New York still continue to use well water, and um, by this time in the middle 1700s, um, dozens of street wells originally with the uh, bucket and pole type, but now fitted with brass pumps. Uh, the water, though, which was never very good to begin with, was uh, uh, continued to be terrible, except at the tea water pump, which cost money. Uh, the verdict of a visiting Englishman in 1760, uh, quoting, New York is subject to one great inconvenience, which is the want of fresh water. Along comes a fellow named Christopher Collis to try to do something about that in 1774. He suggests uh, to the city, and the city agrees to build it and finance it, the New York Water Works. And he uh, built a, sunk a well on Upper Broadway, where I showed you near White Street. He built a, excuse me, a two million gallon reservoir and he endeavored to fill that reservoir from the well with a steam engine, which was probably the second steam engine built in America, and he had built the first one in Philadelphia shortly after he emigrated a couple of years earlier. Now, Christopher Collis, when he was an older man, uh, was supposedly often said, had I been brought up to the trade of hatter, people would begin to come into the world without heads. Which is a way of saying that many of the things that Christopher Collis started didn't quite get finished. And in this case, the New York Water Works, and I, I, I think I neglected to mention that from that Water Works up on Broadway, he was going to lay a hollowed log pipes down to the city and distribute water to all as a public utility. Um, we, that quote indicates that uh, very little of what Christopher Collis tried to do got done. And in fact, in this case, the revolution intervened, and that was the end of the New York Water Works. The situation in New York continues. New York is still relying on uh, wells, street pumps, and this is Broad Street in 1797, a very placid, uh, serene scene, looking north on Broadway to the second city hall. The building now there is Federal Hall, different building. And along here are street pumps along the side of the road. Now this is a very um, serene scene, but a year later, this is 1797, a year later the serenity is uh, broken uh, rather dramatically by yellow fever, uh, which had plagued the city since 1702. Uh, in 1798, 2,000 out of 60,000 New Yorkers died of yellow fever. That's one in 30, a fairly astounding number. Uh, nobody knew, of course, that the transmission agent was infected mosquitoes, which bred in the outlying swamplands. Uh, most people blamed miasmas of bad air, uh, some figured that clean water must have something to do with it. And one of those people that uh, thought he might profit by it was Aaron Burr. Now, if Burr had been trained as a hatter, uh, he probably would have convinced everyone that they needed two heads. Uh, the, the story of his Manhattan company is, is a very co complex one. I think I've boiled it down to a nutshell. Uh, when he was a state assemblyman in 1799, uh, he pushed through the legislature, the state legislature, a bill incorporating his Manhattan Company to supply the city with water from what was then the pristine Bronx River on the mainland, then part of Westchester, now part of the, uh, part of the Bronx. Uh, the charter that he deftly devised uh, allowed the supposed water company to do some banking as well. And so the Manhattan Company used most of its unprecedented $2 million capitalization to make loans. And it survives today as J.P. Morgan Chase, recently called Chase Manhattan, and the Manhattan is the Manhattan, is the Manhattan Company, which merged with the Chase National Bank in 1955, now called, uh, called J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, now, of course, instead of risking all their money on uh, a very expensive effort to harness the Bronx River, uh, the company built a very modest waterworks right on Chamber Street, just south of what was then, by then called the Collect Pond, 
and increasingly the repository of all of the city's uh, various wastes and occasional murder victims. Uh, just uh, between Chamber Street and Reed Street, they, um, the company uh, erected a horse-worked pump uh, over a well supplied by what were then the co very compromised uh, subterranean sources of the Collect Pond. I think you can probably see the horses there. And a meager 100,000 gallon reservoir on Chamber Street. Now this is at a time when the city is, is getting ready to expand to 100,000 people. It would be about a gallon a day, not very much. Uh, that reservoir was torn down in the 1850s and the surrogate court building uh, is at the location now. And the company also laid a very leaky network of hollowed log pipes the same sort of pipes that Collis might have laid 25 years earlier but didn't get around to. And if you remember that view of uh, looking up uh, Broad Street, this is again looking up Broad Street to the second city hall. And if you note the pipes, hollowed, wooden, hollowed yellow pine log pipes, and notice this end fitting here, sort of the, the male end to be fit into a, a, a log pipe with a female end. And um, I'll pause on that for one second and just say that over the next 40 years, the company was founded in 1799, over the next 40 years, uh, the company's banking business took off, um, but because its, char its charter required the company to provide water, the company continued to make a show of supplying water, though it didn't do a very good job of it. And at the same time, company lawyers claimed that the company had a monopoly on local water rights, and this prevented other uh, possible private and public and the city from developing supplies that would threaten the company's charter and thus its banking operations. Um, as inefficient as the Manhattan Company was, it was in any case the city's first piped water supply. And if you think this might be very ancient history, um, these pipes are still with us. And that's, I, I hope you can see that. These are, do you remember that, that pipe being laid with the male end? Well, here's one just like it, and a female end here. And these, this is a close-up of two pipes that were found on Coenty Slip, at Coenty Slip in, during a Parks Department uh, excavation in October. And they're 13 and a half feet long with 10-inch uh, inner diameters. And um, through what I would say is a very unique collaboration between various city bureaucracies, uh, archaeologists, historians, and other interested people. These pipes are now being preserved um, through with monies arranged for by the Department of Environmental Protection. And hopefully, at some point in the future, will be displayed publicly together. <coughs> For New York City, with the Manhattan Company around and uh, not much water flowing through its pipes, it was back to the pumps. And this is a, the intersection of Day Street and Greenwich Street in 1810 with a mother and her child pumping water. This intersection was covered up by the World Trade Center and it is now going to be uh, reopened. Now, the scene was not always so genteel as that at Greenwich and Day. Um, and of course, the water from these pumps was, as, as always, uh, uh, undesirable. Uh, in 1810, a former Manhattan Company director wrote, inhabitants literally in their water are drinking in a proportion of their own evacuations, as well as that of their horses, cows, dogs, cats, and other putrid liquids so plentifully dispensed. <laughs> now, there were relatively few options. Um, this is an image of uh, the intersection of Park Row and Broadway in 1830. You notice a, uh, this cart carrying what actually is spring water, uh, which um, these purveyors essentially replace the tea water uh, uh, which shut down in the early 1800s as its subterranean sources were compromised around the Collect Pond. And these guys brought water 
from up island, from many of those streams up island, which were still clean, where uh, the island was still uninhabited. Um, by 1830, the city was becoming a relatively uh, densely built uh, place, still confined uh, below 14th Street, and um, largely in wood-built structures. And so, in, 19, in 1830, um, the city actually constructed its first public piped water supply. And it was a very limited operation, and it was called the 13th Street Reservoir, which is this building here, an octagonal building. Inside it is a large iron tank. Beneath it is an immense well, and uh, the smoke is the, uh, from a steam engine pumping water from the well into the tank, and water was distributed by a uh, cast iron uh, pipe down through the city. The water from this well was uh, not drinkable and was only used, the, the system was only used for fighting fires. Um, something else notable about the 13th Street system, um, with it come the first recorded deaths of workers in service to uh, the city's public water supply. The city paid $89.46 uh, in funeral costs for three men killed uh, blasting out the immense well underneath uh, the 13th Street Reservoir. There were many more deaths in 1832 from cholera. Uh, this was a global epidemic that started in Asia in 1826, uh, made its way um, uh, through Europe, uh, through London in 1831 where this 12-year-old this girl died. Um, it hit New York City in the summer of 1832 and killed 3,500 out of what were then 225,000 New Yorkers, uh, one in 60, an astounding total, um, maybe not so high as the yellow fever, uh, the, uh, a, a lower percentage than, was taken, than were taken by yellow fever uh, 30 years earlier, but by this time, 1832, New York City has uh, uh, turned into essentially the leading city in uh, uh, the United States after the completion of the Erie Canal, and this is really no way to run a city with 3,500 people dying and during that summer 100,000 people fleeing. Um, of course, as with yellow fever, nobody at the time knew the cause of cholera. Uh, the cholera bacterium wasn't identified until uh, the 1880s. Uh, also unknown, the transmission agent, the transmission agent, which was polluted water, uh, this was, uh, polluted water was inevitable, uh, considering that uh, public street wells were under assault from above, as we knew, as, as we were told, as I told you earlier, and private wells invariably uh, shared yards with privies. Finally, and I'm told I am going long, so let me move quickly. Finally, a water hero for New York, Mindert Van Shake, a founder of NYU and a horrified alderman uh, during uh, the cholera, and a state senator just after. And as Burr had uh, uh, sort of rigged the legislative uh, 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 um, uh, process to get his private company, Mindert Van Shake, over the uh, course of the next three years, came up with a plan and had bills passed to create the Croton Aqueduct. Um, I'm going to move quickly. Um, not everybody was in favor of the Croton Aqueduct, especially Westchester landowners who were concerned about um, their property rights and the invasion of their county by uh, New York City from outside its borders. Uh, anybody who was unconvinced became convinced in December 1835 when preliminary studies were still ongoing for the aqueduct. Uh, this is the Great Fire of 1835. That's uh, Wall Street looking south, destroyed 700 buildings south of Wall Street east of uh, Broadway. And the, there was no water to speak of available from the Manhattan Company, from Wells, and very little from the 13th Street system. An aqueduct commission uh, oversaw construction of the Croton Aqueduct, and the commission was headed by ex-mayor Stephen Allen. The engineering department was run by Erie Canal veteran John Jervis, whose slide I seem to have lost. And it featured uh, young engineers, such as Fayette B. Tower, uh, who at 
21 years old, uh, typically of the time, had little engineering education or experience, but as we'll see later, illustrated, uh, illustrated beautifully. Uh, here's a just basic map of the Croton Aqueduct from the Croton River here. There was a dam here which created this reservoir down along the, uh, uh, the uh, eastern side of uh, the Hudson River, down through Yonkers to the High Bridge, which we'll talk about, and then down into Manhattan. Uh, the work was... Um, bid out in 100 sections to independent contractors who mostly hired Irish immigrants. Here's a scene of uh, workers on the aqueduct section. Um, most of the aqueduct workers worked very hard. Occasionally they got upset when their dollar a day pay was lowered and uh, supposedly uh, needed, uh, required the militia the, the militia needed to be called out to quell their activities. A lot of this was probably uh, anti-Irish sentiment that was fostered in newspapers like the New York Herald. Uh, when the aqueduct uh, opened in 1842, after seven years of construction, it was truly a spectacular accomplishment. Um, this is the dam on the Croton River. Uh, water was backed up behind here and started its way in the uh, aqueduct here. This is the arch at uh, what's now Ossining. The aqueduct is in the top of the arch. The arch is available. People can go in it now. It's closed. Uh, no longer serves, no longer water flowing through it, but it's now a, a tourist attraction in Ossining. Here's the arch. Uh, here's the crossing of Mill River, the Bacantico River, uh, near Sleepy Hollow. And I'm just going to really speed through. Here is the high bridge, which we've all talked about. This is those drawings and this one done by Fayette Tower, the young engineer. Uh, this is looking south uh, from the Westchester, now Bronx side of the river. Uh, here's the crossing of, of what was then called the Clendenning Valley. It was uh, replaced by an underground pipe siphon in the 1870s. It's now Amsterdam Avenue in the low 100s. And when this uh, crossing was built, it was intended, it was known that there would be streets there eventually, and that's why these arches were built. But clearly, in the 1840s, no streets yet. Uh, the York Hill Reservoir was the uh, receiving reservoir for all the water from the Croton Aqueduct. Um, it is now buried. It was filled in in the 1930s, buried beneath what is now the Great Lawn. And if you look around very closely, you can see the top, the very top of the southwest corner of the wall by the Delacorte Theater. Uh, the Murray Hill Reservoir at uh, Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street in the 1840s clearly is still a very rural place. Fifth Avenue, 42nd Street, now the site of, now the site of the New York Public Library. Uh, big celebration in 1842, the largest celebration that the city, uh, probably the second largest celebration after the Erie Canal celebration uh, 17 years earlier. And of course, um, the uh, Croton system uh, gave us uh, new comfort and a new profession, the Croton plumber. And new splendor. This is Union Square looking south with a beautiful fountain at Union Square, just as there was at City Hall. Um, the Croton Aqueduct inspired uh, best-selling author Lydia Marie, Maria Child, who wrote uh, the, uh, the slaying verse over the river and through the wood. But she wrote about Croton, oh, who that is, has, has not been shut up in the great prison cell of a city and made to drink of its brackish springs can estimate the blessings of the Croton Aqueduct clean, sweet, abundant water. And by 1859, New York sees itself as uh, the center of the world. Uh, a century or so before uh, that New Yorker cover noted our uh, late 20th century provincialism. And finally, uh, the system that we have now brought to us by Lizzie from uh, Magic School Bus. The Croton system here, the Catskill system here, 
and the Delaware system here. And I think with that, you get a sense of the system we have now. Croton provides 10% of our water. Catskill and Delaware, which Joel will talk about and others, provides 90% of our water. I'm sorry, I went very long. My son is going to be very disappointed. But I'm done, and now we'll move on to Joel. He took me halfway through my talk. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I think that one of the things that we have to recognize about the New York City water system as a fundamental issue is that uh, there are very few systems like it where essentially what you're drinking when you drink it is rainwater. And when you're finished with it, it goes out into the receiving waters, the salt water in New York Harbor, gets transpired back into uh, the clouds again and then drops again as rain so this is one of the few water systems where water is used by only one individual or one city or one, one municipality at a time most of the water systems in the world are riverine systems are used by city after city after city after city um, also because most of it is taken out of wells most of it tends to have minerals metals in it and what have you because basically what we're drinking is rainwater it generally is very pure, very soft, and uh, it is a unique system. Largest system, by the way, that we're aware of in the world. Uh, I guess what I need to talk about at this point is that when the, the Croton system went into uh, play, the city finally, for the first time, had an ability uh, to bring water down from an area outside of its own boundaries that they knew was pure. And as a result of that, and as a result of the fact that bright, bright people who preceded us in running what is today DEP and the various other municipal agencies and state agencies that assist us basically mean that this city can exist because if the water system uh, did not exist, this city would not last two months. There is no way to maintain a population density such as we have here without this water system. And you know the age of it, you've already heard the age of it, and you've heard the beginnings of it. After the old Croton system, or the original Croton system, was built and the dam was built, the city began to take an enormous interest and liking in the consumption of water. And it started consuming water to the point where there was beginning to be less water available than they really needed. And the first decision was made to go back to the Croton system go down river from where the dam was, build a higher dam, and impound a larger reservoir behind it, and that was done, and the capacity of the system went from 75 million gallons a day up to 400 million gallons a day when the new, when the new Croton Aqueduct uh, was completed and started, and, and dam were completed and started providing us with water. Uh, by now, uh, the old Croton Dam, by the way, is still in place, in the reservoir and occasionally can be seen when the conditions are right. Uh, but we, we had now a thirst for water, if I can coin a phrase, and immediately after the completion of the new Croton system, it became apparent we needed more water. Now you will hear about the tumult that that engendered when we got outside of our own area and got further and further afield and got more and more ability to take water because the city of New York uniquely has extraterritoriality rights to take water from outside of its own boundaries, and it has the right by a, a grant from the state legislature to go wherever it needs to to get water and to take it. Um, that you heard earlier what kind of problems were engendered in what is today the Bronx when we went in and decided to build the Croton system. Uh, when you take a look and you saw on the slides the size of the uh, systems that are west of the Hudson, uh, you can get some idea of the amount of people who were impacted, even though the population, even to this day, is fairly thin. But there were a lot of people involved and a lot of people negatively impacted by what we were doing. In any event, uh, we started construction on the Delaware and the Catskill systems. Um, the Catskill system was started in 1907, completed in 1917. Uh, with expansion in 1926. The capacity now, 550 million gallons a day from that system. So you can see the size of what's occurring. Uh, why did the systems become necessary? Well, 
you've heard of this, this phrase, Greater New York City, which goes back to 1898, and every once in a while someone sees a logo of the Greater New York, and it says 1898 on it. That's when Brooklyn, which was using well water and pond water from Nassau County, what is today Queens County, and even as far out east as Suffolk County, found itself unable to keep the system functioning, did not have adequate water supply to fight fires, uh, had a very poor quality of water, and were told that if they joined the city of New York, they could have that wonderful water that comes from the north. The vote of the Brooklyn City Council was by one vote. That's how contestive it was uh, for the city, and the city of Brooklyn decided to join the city of New York at that point in time, and we needed to expand the water supply system rapidly because the population of the city of New York had now doubled as a result of that, and we now had three and a half million people in the city of New York. It's 1898. The Catskill system, as I said, was started in 1907, completed in 1917. Water now travels over 100 miles into the city from the north and through a tunnel that runs underneath the Hudson River 1,100 feet deep. Keep in mind, and you'll hear from the sand hogs later, that this is primarily at this point in time that we're talking about hand labor. Yes, they had explosives, but besides explosives, they had shovels, they had picks, and they had strong backs. Um, there's another interesting thing you heard earlier that it was primarily Irish immigrants who built the system. Uh, most of you may not be aware of it. I think a good number of you are, but New York City DEP has its own police department. That police department today protects the system, uh, but that's not what it was put together for. The origin of the police department for New York City was to protect the residents in the watershed area where the aqueducts were being built against the wild Irish immigrants on a Friday and a Saturday night. So <laughs> political compromises are large and small. Uh, the Delaware system was started in 1937. It was just a continuous increase in the size of the population that required it. It was stopped, obviously, during World War II. It had neither labor nor material to be completed. It was completed in 1965. That system has a capacity of 800 million gallons a day. We're now talking about a total capacity in the three systems of 1.5 billion gallons per day. Water, water tunnels one and two um, provide water when the uh, Croton uh, system was in place, only the Croton aqueduct and uh, uh, was necessary because of the areas that were served by it. But when the Delaware system and the Catskill system were built, it was necessary to distribute the water further down, south and east, into the outer boroughs, and Tunnel 1 and Tunnel 2 were started. Tunnel 1 obviously running through uh, Manhattan, Tunnel 2 ultimately running through uh, Queens and ending up at the Hillview Reservoir through the Bronx, through Queens, <laughs> and terminating in the area of the Brooklyn end of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, where it connects to the only source of water, only reliable source of water, uh, to Staten Island, which is the Richmond Tunnel, which was completed in 1936. Up until that time, uh, there was no water available to Staten Island from off the island itself, and you had to use the local wells and the local ponds for water. Um, it's interesting, by the way, the system is so set up that the city, which overnight basically sends water down to fill up the reservoirs that we use, finds out that when it, uh, by gravity, runs the water into the Staten Island uh, tanks, the, uh, the department has to basically shut down the valving on it on an overnight basis because otherwise, as the Brooklyn people woke up in the morning and started using water, they would suck the water back out of the, <laughs> out of the Staten Island pipe and the poor folks in Staten Island wouldn't have any water. Um, the one problem with the system, and by the way, understand that the tunnel systems are bare. There is no pipe. There's no structure to them. They are holes bored through living rock. The only thing that's been put on the inside of them where necessary is basically a concrete grout to, increase the, uh, to decrease the coefficient of friction so that the water flows and gives better pressure. But there is no, there is no units that are in those water tunnels. It's bare rock. Is what it is. Um, until the big dig 
In Boston, which you heard of a little bit earlier here, I think they were talking about uh, the commissioner and the big dig in Boston. Um, this was the largest, Tunnel 3 was the largest civil works project in the world. A 50-year project, a $6 billion price tag, and a 60-mile length. Uh, and it was started in 1970. This is 2005. The hope and expectation, I hope, Charlie, is still that we'll have it completed in the year 2020. God willing, and the river doesn't rise, as the saying goes. <laughs> uh, what does Tunnel uh, 3 give us? Tunnel 3, for the first time, gives us not a linear water system, but a circular water system. It doesn't take a great deal of engineering knowledge to know that if you have a linear system running water from one end to the other, and you have a breakage or a blockage or a problem someplace in the middle, no water comes out the other end of the pipe. But with a circular system, if you get a break or any kind of a problem anywhere in the loop, the water can go the other way around the loop. So for the first time, you have the redundancy of having a loop rather than a linear system. Uh, the system, by the way, was designed to be fully completed before it was to be turned on at all. And back in about 1998, that struck me since uh, uh, stage one was completed and just laying there, it struck me as odd because we could use the water, we could use the pressure, and we could use the redundancy. And uh, at my request, changes were made to the design so that we could turn on stage one, and we in fact did turn on stage one, which is presently in service and brings water from the Bronx down into Manhattan, and then uh, finally terminates in Astoria in Queens at a valve chamber there. Um, stage two runs from Astoria, to the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel through Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, the stage two, the boring of that was completed in about 2001. The shafts are now under construction, and this thing, the uh, stage two should be activated within four or five years. Uh, the second part of stage two, which is from Central Park to the Battery and up to the 30s in a loop, kind of a fish hook, is now being tunneled. Um, there will be some time before that's completed, but it's a smaller tunnel because it's at the lower end of the system, and as a result, it's not as big a diameter tunnel as stage one was, so it's probably moving faster. Plans call for a uh, final stage four to take water from the Van Cortland Park valve chamber, which is obviously under Van Cortland Park, uh, to Eastern Queens to possibly serve the uh, development of Eastern Queens and maybe, and I'll talk about it a little later, possibly some of the counties to the east of there. Let me talk to you for a few minutes about the Delaware Aqueduct leak. The Delaware Aqueduct provides the source of water from the Delaware system down into New York City. When it finally went into service uh, in the late 50s, um, there was a problem with the gauging. The, for some reason, they couldn't get the gauges to jibe correctly, and eventually they determined to shut the tunnel off, which they did went into the tunnel and found that they basically had a leak west of the Hudson at an area where there was a fault in the rock, which they had sleeved. The only part of the tunnel that has any structure to it at all, they put a sleeve in it for some 100 feet on either side of what they believed to be the fault, uh, but apparently it wasn't effective enough to solve the problem, and that uh, aqueduct has been leaking uh, fairly steadily since 1957. Depending upon the amount of water that flows down it, that is the needs of you and I as we use the water, uh, there is as much as 30, 35 million gallons a day loss in that. Now the system capacity is 1.5 billion gallons, as I told you, so 35 to 38 million uh, gallons per day doesn't sound like a lot of water, but it's a significant amount of water <laughs> if you dropped into it, let's put it that way. Uh, it's not something I think we should be proud of, and we determined that we would seal that leak. Now, let me say one other thing. The normal leakage for water systems in the United States, believe it or not, runs around 20%. That is, 20% of the water that is source water gets lost in the system someplace, somewhere. That does not include losses in your property and my property. It's in the system itself. The New York City system at this time, including the Delaware leak, is about 6% leakage. So we've got a very tight system. We also have one of the oldest systems in the United States because of where we are in 
um, the country and where the country was developed from. So that also is a, is a uh, situation that we have to deal with. Um, one of the concerns that we have is how do we solve that leaking problem? And the department has basically entered into a contract with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. They built a miniature submarine. Um, it is a untethered submarine, which means you just drop it in and it runs through the aqueduct. Um, and it has the capability on board it to take photographs and various other measurements. It can be changed. There are different modules that can be put into it. And the department is, as we speak, trying to analyze what it's going to do and how is the best way to resolve that problem. I had an interesting conversation with the then commissioner of DEC, the state agency, when we were talking about this leak because one of the things I pointed out to him was that when we cured that leak, there were significant numbers of ponds, springs, and rivulets that people at the surface thought were steady and were going to be natural, and we were going to shut them down. <laughs> uh, and it's against the law in New York State to change a water course. Uh, he said to me, I'll have to think about that, and then I think he left his job about two months later. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to work out, but it's going to be interesting. Uh, the major concern with the leak from our perspective is while it's a fairly contained and stable leak now, at some point in the future it could destabilize, we could get some rock breaking free around the, uh, the fault, it could partially uh, clog the aqueduct, uh, reducing the water supply. Uh, that's not something we want to face, so we do want to see if we can't resolve the issue. We are talking about 50% of the water supply of the city of New York. Since we're talking about the issue of needing water and wanting to make sure that we've got it, let me talk a little bit about uh, citywide water conservation initiatives. Uh, one of the problems that we had, and I think there are a number of us here who would remember it, when Donald wanted to build the West Side project, one of the big issues was, was there going to be enough water to handle that? And one of the big problems was that the, the uh, capability at the North River Wastewater Treatment Plant was not going to be adequate to handle it. To make a long story short, one of the things we recognized was that if we could reduce the flow of water uh, from the system into the wastewater system, we could reduce the size of the wastewater plants and improve their efficiency. So the city embarked through DEP upon a program of encouraging people to install low flow toilets at a point in time when they had basically just come out onto the scene. Uh, and in fact, they agreed to pay for the installation of a low flow toilet for anyone who was willing to replace a high flow toilet with one. Um, and there was a rebate program established. Uh, that program effectively changed about 25% of the uh, toilets in the city of New York from ba wasteful, um, uh, toilets down to 1.6 gallons per flush. Uh, by the way, some of them work well, some of them work not so well. Uh, people learn which ones work well, and most of them today I think are, are very functional. I don't think we have any problem with it. However, uh, in addition to that, we have a stable population of about 8 million people. It hasn't gone up. If we can reduce the capacity um, uh, or the amount of water being consumed, we obviously can save not only on the, the water itself, have an extra supply, but we can also reduce our costs in handling the whole problem. Um, the conservation measures taken included that. Um, at, by the time we had gotten to about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the consumption had gone over 2 billion gallons per day total. Uh, consumption is down considerably from that. We're down to about 1.6 billion gallons. Um, that's a 20% reduction. It's now stable. You are not able any longer at a plumbing supply house to buy a wasteful toilet. You must buy a low flow toilet, which means that the other 75% of the toilets that are in the city will, as time evolves and renovations take place and condominiums get uh, converted into, uh, there will be an additional constant saving of water. Um, we also decided that another measure would be highly effective would be to call for universal metering. Most people who were residential tenants and residential occupants did not have meters. They paid on a frontage basis. And I, I live in Howard Beach, and I had two old houses on either side of me, and I built a new home, and I had a water meter. 
and I, it, it didn't dawn on me what they were doing, and this is many years ago, but one of my neighbors one morning came out and said, if you ever need to wash your car, use my hose. <laughs> well, that doesn't encourage the saving of water, obviously, because he doesn't care what he uses. He's paying the same amount for it, whether he uses twice as much or less. He's got a meter now. He doesn't loan me his hose anymore. <laughs> Okay, I think one other thing we can talk about is the uh, old Jamaica water supply well system in South Queens. Um, we took that over about six years ago, I think that's about right, uh, because Jamaica water supply basically could not supply adequate uh, volume of water and couldn't supply adequate quality of water. And we had been blending and selling them city water for a period of time before that because they couldn't meet the health standards. When we eventually took it over, um, we were able to continue to use that. And I think one of the things we're looking at is the uh, greater usage of well water because with modern science and modern technology, we can get a much better quality out of well water than they could uh, back in the colonial days and, and going much further than that. So we are looking into that. The other thing is that the eastern branch of the third water tunnel, as I told you, goes into Queens. And one of the things I think most people know about but don't think about is that Nassau and Suffolk have a limited capability to provide potable water. And it has not been increasing. Because as the population of Nassau and Suffolk increase, the aquifers beneath it from which they take their water tend to become more and more polluted with various uh, waste items and soaps and what have you. Uh, and as they pump more and more water out of the aquifers, the salt water fronts from both the ocean and the Long Island Sound tend to keep moving towards the center spine of the island. Um, and I think they've got a fundamental problem that may not occur in your lifetime or my lifetime, but I think it will occur in the lifetime of my grandchildren. And the bottom line is I don't see any solution for it other than to take water from Connecticut, which becomes an interstate problem, running it underneath Long Island Sound, or basically tying it into our system and having us assist them. And one of the things we have been looking at or were looking at when I was at the agency was the idea of using some of the water that we tend to get in this weather right now. If you go up to the aqueduct and uh, look at the reservoirs now, you'll find most of the reservoirs are spilling water over the dam because they're full. That water is now going out into the Hudson River and eventually ends up in the ocean. It's totally wasted. If we could pump that water into the aquifers in Nassau County, we could store the water there for our future use if we need it, help stabilize Nassau County's salt water front, help provide them with a better source of pure water, etc. And if Nassau County and Suffolk County don't wake up to this fairly soon, and I tried to wake them up to it when I was commissioner, but the bottom line is that at some point they're going to scream to some governor that they need help, and we need to be able to prepare uh, be prepared to answer that, that call. 